Welcome to Electro Online, and now we're going to go into a little bit more detail on, on stellar classification, especially in the area of spectral class. Now, you saw this in the previous video. We have the HR diagram here. We're talking about the stars on the main sequence, how they were separated into what they call their spectral class, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, the different kinds of main sequence stars. So now let's talk a little bit more detail on that. And in addition to that, let's also make mention that we have some that are not really stars. We call them brown dwarfs. And maybe I should write that completely here, brown dwarfs. And these are what we call uh, stars that didn't quite make it as a star. But in other words, there was not enough material to cause enough pressure at the center of the star to start nuclear fusion. To start nuclear fusion, you have to have at least a temperature of 10 million degrees Kelvin. And if the star isn't big enough to begin with, if there is enough mass so that gravity will press, press the star together to the point where the temperature reaches that 10 million degrees at the center, nuclear fusion never starts. So these are what we call failed stars. They didn't quite make it as a star. And there's three different classes of those. We call them the L, the T, and the Y, brown dwarfs. And notice the temperature for the L-type is from 1.3 to 2.5 thousand Kelvin. For the T-class stars, it's from 600 to 1300 degrees Kelvin. And finally, the Y brown dwarfs are, have temperatures of less than 600 Kelvin. Now, that's still quite a bit. That's still a fairly warm temperature. It's well above the boiling temperature of water. So there is a, quite a bit of heat being generated there, but not because of nuclear fusion, simply because of the uh, pressure conditions that exist in the star from the formation that it then emits that temperature for many billions of years afterwards. So it, I should say emit heat for many billions of years afterwards. In addition to that, we also have what we call the S, the C, and the D class stars, and we get into that in just a moment. So what we're going to do here is look at the different classifications, look at the abundance of the star, meaning how many of those stars are there out in the universe, and then how do we recognize them? Why do we call these spectral classes? Well, it's because we look at the spectrum of the stars, the light coming from the stars, and we see very specific identifying uh, what we call spectral lines within the spectrum of those stars that will enable us to, differ to differentiate between the different classes. For example, the O-class star, the very hot, very big blue hot stars that are up in the upper left corner of the main sequence, the abundance of those is there's about one in three million. So roughly one in every three million stars is an O-class star. So they're very, very rare. They're very large stars. One of the reasons why they're so rare is because they don't last very long. They burn up their hydrogen inside their core so quickly that they typically only last a few million, maybe five, 10 million at the most years, and then they turn to red giants and then they're no longer main sequence stars. So one of the reasons why there's such a small abundance of them is that they don't last very long. Looking at our sun, our sun has been around for almost 5 billion years, so stars like the sun are around for a very long time, so they must therefore be much more abundant on that factor alone. The reason why we can tell that they're O-class stars is because they have uh, what we call uh, ionized helium, doubly ionized oxygen, doubly ionized nitrogen, and doubly ionized silicon in their spectrum. So when we find those spectral lines associated with those ions of those elements, we can then say that that must therefore be an O-class star. So that's how we recognize them. A B-class star, they're much more abundant relative to O-class stars. Of course, they also last a lot longer. B-class stars may last as much as 50, 100 million years before they turn into red giants. So therefore, there's many more of them because they just stick around longer. And so roughly about 0.125% of all stars, one out of 800 is a B-class star. We can recognize those on the spectral lines by realizing we have neutral helium, we have neutral hydrogen, ionized oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and silicon within the spectral line. So that's how we can differentiate between the oxygen and, um, I shouldn't say oxygen, between the O class and the B class stars. Then we have the A class stars. Those are what we call right here A class stars. They're, of course, the white stars like Sirius. The abundance is almost 1% of all the stars, a little bit less, about two thirds of a percent is the abundance of A-class stars. That's where we find stars that have the hydrogen line to be the strongest. So the, the most recognizable hydrogen lines are found in A-class stars. That's how we recognize them. Uh, we also have ionized calcium, ionized magnesium, and ionized iron. So when we see those elements ionized uh, like that, we can, in the, spectral, in the spectrum of the stars, we can then say those are A-class stars. The F-class stars, which are the kind of whitish, yellowish stars, a little bit bigger and, and hotter than the sun. The abundance of those stars is about 3% of all stars fall in that category. 
The hydrogen lines are somewhat weaker than they are in the A-class stars. We still have ionized calcium, but we also begin to see ionized metals within the spectral lines of those stars. The G-class stars, which is the stars like our sun, the, the sun, that type of star is, is in abundance. About 7.5% of all the stars are G-class stars, so that's almost 1 in 10. The hydrogen lines are weaker again. They're still ionized cal calcium, but what separates them from the F-class stars is that not only do they have ionized metals, they also have neutral metal lines in the spectrum. So that's when we begin to differentiate them. When we start seeing neutral metals, the spectral lines of neutral metals, then we know we're talking about a G-class star instead of an F-class star. And of course, we also know that the hydrogen lines are weaker in G-class stars than they are in F-class stars. Then we go to the next class, which is the K-class. So we have about one in eight of all the stars in the universe, at least in our neighborhood. So we kind of think that's probably the same in the rest of the universe, are K-class stars. Hydrogen lines are weaker again than in G-class stars. There we see that the calcium lines are the strongest. So when we see very strong calcium lines in the spectral lines, then we know we're talking about a K-class star. We're looking at a K-class star. And there the neutral metals are much stronger than they are in the G-class stars. And finally, for the small red, red stars at the bottom of the main sequence right here, the M-class stars, notice that about three-quarters of all the stars in the universe are those small red stars. And there we can recognize them from the spectral lines that we see titanium oxide lines in the spectral lines. And also the, the neutral metals lines are very strong there, just like they are strong in the K in the K-class stars, but what differentiates between the K and the M is that we see, all of a sudden, the appearance of titanium oxide in the spectral lines. On the brown dwarfs, of course, those are what we call the failed stars. They never started nuclear fusion. The surface temperatures can be seen simply by using Wien's law. Based upon that, we can kind of see what type of brown dwarfs we're talking about. And finally, there's three more classes of stars. There's actually more than three more, but the ones that we like to talk about here is the S-class, the C-class, and the D-class. Now, the S-class is a class that's somewhat between the red stars and the red giants. So when we are in, in between there, what we find is that besides seeing titanium oxide, we also begin to see zirconium oxide. And so that's when we know that those stars are probably on a, a transition a stage between being a main sequence star here and being a red giant. So we call those S-class stars. Then we have what we call the carbon stars. When red giants get to be near the end of their life cycle and a lot of their helium has been converted into carbon, we start seeing very strong carbon lines in the, uh, in the spectrum. And so we call those the carbon stars. So that typically are the red giants are near the end cycle of their life before they become white dwarfs. And finally, we have what we call the degenerate stars. And I think I'm missing an E right here, the degenerate stars. And those are the... Actually, I would like to call them the carbon stars because those are what we call the white dwarf. The degenerate stars are what we call the white dwarf stars when all the other layers have been spewed out and what's left there is simply the core, the dying core of a star. When all the nuclear fusion uh, stops and uh, I guess the reason why they call them degenerate stars is because it's the degeneracy between the electrons, the repulsive forces between the electrons that keeps them from collapsing even further. So they collapse into small carbon balls called white, white dwarfs, and those are right in this region right here. The white dwarfs are right in here. So we call this the de degenerate stars because it's electron degeneracy that keeps them from collapsing any farther. I would like to call them carbon stars because they're basically made out of balls of carbon, but it's already decided for me. I can't change it, of course. And so here we have a nice list of the predominant stars in the universe. So O through M are what we call the main sequence stars. L, T, Y are, white, are the brown dwarfs or the field stars. S are the ones in transition from main sequence, from the red kind of stars in main sequence, out to red giants. And of course, notice that three quarters of all stars will go to that stage because S represents red, red stars going to the red giants stage, showing zirconium oxide in their spectrum. Then we have what we call the carbon stage where most of, the, most of the fusion process is completed and the core of the star is predominantly carbon and that's the end stage of the red giant. And finally, the degenerate stars when they become white dwarfs and all we have left is a ball of carbon and all the other layers have spewed out into the universe. And so now we have kind of a good idea of the type of classes there are. So this is what we call the spectral class of stars. 
We have the ones on the main sequence, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. We have the brown dwarfs. We have the ones beyond the, the cycle, beyond the stage of the uh, main sequence. And that gives you a pretty good idea of the abundance of the stars as well, as well as how we actually recognize them in their spectrum when we, when we uh, use, uh, we typically use diffraction gratings, we look at the light, we separate the colors, we look at the spectrum, we look at the dark lines in the spectrum and we see those particular lines and that's how we know what kind of, what kind of star we're looking at. And this is all about classifying stars and being able to identify what we're looking at to help us determine what the luminosity is, what the size of the star is and so forth, and that's ultimately how we use this knowledge to really understand stars better. And that's how we do that, the stellar classification.